morning. It is good for us to gather for worship. It is good for us to be in the house of God as we gather together on this beautiful Sunday morning after the refreshing rain last night. There's just a couple of things that I want to share with you, some announcements about some upcoming opportunities. First and foremost, our exercise class, because of the carpet cleaning and a couple other things, took a break this week. But we are resuming tomorrow morning at 6.30 if anyone wants to join us. I've had several people say that 6.30 in the morning just doesn't work for them, or they've gone back to school and that's not an appropriate or a good time for them to be able to do that. So if you would be interested in an evening group, please let me know that when the ushers pass around the red books, which I'm saying now, so they'll remember to do it. Um, there's yellow slips in there. If you want to just write on there, I might exercise at night and put it in the offering plate, I will get that. And so we want to be able to accommodate everyone as they want to be healthy in mind, body, and spirit. I want to say a quick word about next Sunday night. Um, we are sponsoring, or we are hosting, and this is kind of a first ever event in my mind, but um, it's an end of summer concert and ice cream social featuring a band called Nimbo Dog. And you might be thinking, just the name alone doesn't sound like the kind of music that I would like, but think classical guitar, think um, like jazz, think um, really talented musicians, think homemade ice cream, think about all of the ways that um, we can just spend a cool evening together. We also, in addition to the red books, are going to pass around some sign-up sheets. If you have not had an opportunity to sign up to bring a freezer ice cream, I would be willing to do that. We would appreciate that. And if you are in a place where a lot of people gather, if you have a business, if you go to the senior center, if you have a lot of folks who walk by your house, there are extras of these in the back of the sanctuary on the podium, and you can grab one of those on your way out the door. There's also a small one in your bulletin this morning to remind you. Our connection with this band, again, is that the, the lead guitarist, uh, Victor Rose was one of the sons-in-law of Charlie Gunter, and when I heard him play at Charlie's service, I thought, I could, I could listen to this for a long time, and some of you heard him that day. And so I would invite you to be present next Sunday evening for that opportunity and to invite your friends and neighbors. That's not just in-house, that's for anybody who wants to come. And then I received a note this morning from Sally Andrews. Don't get excited, it's not baby news. But um, there's going to be a choir picnic on September 13th, which is a Sunday evening at 6 o'clock here at the church. Cold pork sandwiches will be provided, and we'll bring the side dishes, and then the first choir rehearsal will take place on September 16th, which is also the first night that our CLC activities will begin. And so we're moving into fall. We're starting to kick into high gear, and it's been a great summer together. The classes have started, and life is beginning to change. Those are the announcements that I needed to share with you this morning. A reminder that as the acolytes come in, and again, we have a, we have a last timer, a graduating member of our acolyte class. Dylan Bolt will be uh, performing this service for God in this church for the last time today, at least in theory, we might talk him into it sometime. And so as our acolytes bring in the light of God's spirit, may our hearts be in an attitude of worship.
My faith looks up to thee. On this first Sunday after a new school year is in the process of beginning, we're thinking a lot about kids and faith and teachers and how they take faith with them to school, administrators, parents. It just whether we have kids in school or not, the start of a new school year speaks to all of us. And so as our band is going to come up this morning, I believe they're going to teach us a new song this morning. And so that's going to be fun for us. But I also want to say this, just because um, I have and my, my mom's next younger sibling, my Aunt Mary Ann, will be, I believe, 92 this year. And she has macular degeneration. She hasn't been able to see for quite some time. She's in an assisted, li assisted living facility in Enon. But for years and years, even when she could not see, I would walk into her room, she would hug me and shake, she would say, honey, who are you wearing? And I would say, what? And she said, who are you wearing? I don't know what that means. And she said, your clothes. I, uh, I don't know. Uh, thrift store special? I don't know. She was so obsessed with labels. And I never could quite please her enough when I would tell her who I was wearing because I wasn't wearing anybody important. I never knew where that came from. Even when she could no longer see, even the color perhaps, she was still obsessed with a label of having the right name. This morning as we consider the word from Ephesians, and we think about what we are instructed to wear as God's people, the only label we are instructed to worry about is Christian. What do we wear on behalf of God? What do we wear that tells the world we are people of Jesus? So as we consider those words and as we think about even the word from the Sermon on the Mount about the sparrows, I invite us to consider what is most important about what we put on our clothing, or Christ. Let's sing. Please stand with us. Church, it's time to get dressed. We don't just get dressed to look good or even to keep warm. The clothes that God lays out for us protect us from far worse than the rain. These clothes protect us from all that is evil. All that is trying to hurt, twist, and destroy. Therefore, put on the full armor of God. In it, you'll stand your ground. In it, you can stand tall. Let us worship God this morning in the joy of that truth. Amen.
drink deep in her wisdom, may we never thirst again. May we go through life refreshing many as a sign of healing for all through the one whose life is eternal. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.
pretty. I like the way you cook. Okay. So when you tried pizza the first time, did you go, this is the best thing I've ever tasted in my entire life? I can't remember. Okay. You've never, you can't remember a day that you didn't know what pizza was? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So tell me a food you don't like. Broccoli mushrooms? So, so did you have to learn that you didn't like it? You don't like cheeseburgers? Okay. Okay, well. Raw zucchini? Okay. We could do this all day, couldn't we? Alright. So here's, okay, so not just, so here's my challenge, okay? It doesn't just have to be food, okay? When school starts back tomorrow, and you go back, wherever you're going, however long you stay, I want you to learn one good thing. No, I want you to learn two good things for every one thing you say, I don't like that. That's my challenge. If you say, ooh, we had broccoli at lunch today, you have to learn two good things. You don't have to, but I want you to. Because you know what? The world is full of people who say, I don't like this, or I hate this, I don't like that word, I really don't like to say it, or this is dumb. How many people say this is dumb before they've even tried something? Okay, so if you find yourself saying that, or saying, ooh, zucchini, or ooh, broccoli, or ooh, mushrooms, for everything you say I don't like, I want you to say two things you do, or learn two things. Because you know what? If we did things more positively, the world would change. We have a whole lot of people that spend every single day saying, ooh, 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 ooh. I don't like this. I don't like this. That's dumb. That's stupid. There's another S word. I, you know, you guys don't need to be that. You need to be the people who go, oh, look at this. Isn't this the coolest thing ever? Look, Lane can juggle. Look. Logan's going to be an acolyte. <gasps> Hudson's in kindergarten. Oh my gosh, you're so tall, you're going to be a great basketball player. I know you can sing. You help take care of your little brothers and sisters. You don't like cheese, but there's so many other good things you can do. You make a masterpiece. You cut yourself shaving. I just had to throw that in there. Kaiser went to kindergarten. Bishop was nice to his brother. A lady started second grade. Sawyer helped take care of his little brothers. Every one of you has awesome stuff about you. If the world was full of people going, you're awesome, you're awesome, you're awesome, you might go, I'm so tired of awesomeness that it would be a better place. Oh, you want to be amazing. I thought you said I want to be a basin. Okay. All right. So that's my that's my homework for you guys this week, okay? Go make the world an amazing place. Alright? Let's pray. Dear God. Thank you for amazing kids. Thank you for all the things we learn. And help us be good. And positive. Amen. Let's do it. <laughs> to us every Sunday morning. They, they come up here and they let me talk to them about stuff and that's one way that they offer themselves and their ministries to this church. I now challenge each one of you to consider how you offer yourselves and your ministries to this church. Whether that be in the offering place as it passes by or whether that be in volunteering to work with our children or youth. Whether that be teaching a Sunday school class. Consider in this moment what offering you have to God even as our ushers pass it on us.
singing in every section. I'm having the best time up here this morning. So thank you for being here. If I haven't already said that, it's a good day for us to worship together. There are some, though, who are having difficult days, and there are some who have requested prayers for ongoing needs and concerns, and I need to update us on some of the names that are on our prayer list, as well as add some names. I would draw our attention to Kathy Carr, and Kathy is not one who easily adds her name to a prayer list, but she is having some tests done this week and has requested prayers for those and for the outcome of those. I know that there are people who are not listed on here who have received cancer diagnoses or who are continuing in testing to determine conditions. And I would just remind us that every week there are names that are not here, but we lift everyone in our prayers who is undergoing medical concerns. Drew Clausen, who resides at Parkside, has, or Parkview, we do that every time, um, has been having issues with her back, ongoing issues, and we lift her in our thoughts and prayers. Brian Legg, many of you know, has been on our prayer list. Brian was diagnosed with ALS. He lives in the nursing home at Gossel, and he has been having some um, changes in his health status, and we lift him and his family in our thoughts and prayers. On our prayer list also has been Dave Geyser, who is a nephew of Sandy Ayers, married to Sandy's niece. He has um, cancer. He was diagnosed some time ago. He um, has been told that there's nothing more that the medical field can do for him. And he is 36 years old and has a family with small children. And we think about Dave, his wife, and consider as they begin to plan for end-of-life issues that most of us can't begin to imagine doing at the age of 36. I also would invite us to be in prayer for our students, for the schools of every school represented as our students return, the college and university students, and a welcome home to Bob and Priscilla Unroom after their trip to Africa. Many of you, if you're on Facebook, saw their, some of their pictures and some of their stories, and we are looking forward to hearing more about that in your reconnection with Fern Valley, and so we will have that in a couple of weeks. It's, it's a reminder to us that whether we are in Africa or in Hillsborough, Kansas, if we go to school in Canton Galva or Marion, wherever we go, if we're in Lehigh or Durham, if we're in Gossel or Hillsborough, we have a walk with Jesus. We remember that wherever we go, we are never alone. And so as we begin praying this morning, and to all of you whose towns I have forgotten, I apologize now because somebody's going to come up afterwards and say, you left out McPherson or someplace else. I'm so sorry. So um, know that I'm thinking your town in my head. But wherever you live, wherever you go, we have a walk with Jesus, especially in difficult times. And so as we begin praying, I invite us to sing those words, just a closer walk with you.
just a closer walk. God, we know that there's no way you can get closer to us. You walk beside us every moment. You never leave our side. Even when we try to get away from you, when we stray from the pathway you set before us, we thank you, O oh God, for always being with us, always staying close. Even as we've just sung and even, even as we live out in our lives, O oh God, we know that there are moments when we feel like no one else knows the burdens that we carry. We feel that we are alone in the world. We feel like nobody has been through or understands what we're experiencing. But, oh God, you know. You know what's on our hearts before we can speak a word. You know how we feel before we can even experience it. And we trust, oh God, that we will continue to walk closely with you. What a, what a privilege, oh God, to be in this place and to call on your name, to, to sing of our love for you, to sing of your love for us. To hear your word as it's read from Holy Scripture. To hear the voices of children. To see their excitement. To, to learn from them as they are learning. What a blessing it is, oh God, for us to be in this place. All ages, all stages, all of us together. Worshiping one God, one Lord. How privileged we are, oh God. And we thank you that we are here. We thank you for every pathway that brought someone to this moment. We thank you, O oh God, that even in moments of sorrow, you have been there with comfort. In moments of joy, you have been there with celebration. In moments of fear, like a first day of school, you have been there with your presence. And we pray, O oh God, that we will never lose sight of that. We trust, O oh God, because we call upon the name of the one you sent to us. We call upon the name of Jesus. We we know, O oh God, that he is our brother, he is our friend. We know that from our earliest days. We teach it to our children. Never let us lose sight of that. Never let us lose that relationship that we have with the one who came to us. His brother, his friend, he is Savior, he is Redeemer. And he gave us a pathway for living. Guide our footsteps on that pathway. Keep us, O oh God, knowing that we share with him. And in everything we do and in everything we say, remind us that our lives begin with him. And they will end with him. And someday we will see face to face, clearly. Thank you for those promises. Thank you that we can share them with others. And thank you that we can claim them. Even as we begin and pray together the prayer Jesus gave us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. lesson today comes from Matthew chapter 6 verses 25 through 29. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They, have, they neither sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon, in all his glory, was not clothed like one of these.
Our New Testament lesson comes from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, and fasten the belt of truth around your waist, and put on the breastplate of righteousness, as shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times, in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. Pray also for me, so that when I speak, a message may be given to me to make known with fullness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it boldly, as I must speak. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So some of you know that I was on a trip this week, and I have finally figured out the way to keep people from talking to me on planes. Work on a sermon. I didn't have a Bible with me, but I had my notes and my pages, my reference pages, and I was juggling papers all over the place, and not one person talked to me. A lot of people read over my shoulder. That was interesting. <coughs> was kind of fun. But as I was flying and thinking about this morning and, and you know, when, I, when I'm going to be gone, the bulletin is already put together, so Sharon can print it. And, you know, I thought it was a genius for asking Tracy to sing his eyes on the sparrow. And you know what? I was right. So, um, and the hands came together. And before I left town, everything was together except what I was going to say. So I started thinking about it, and as my sister and I were talking this week, and there's 13 years difference in our ages, and so our experiences of school are very different. And it made me realize the vast experience represented in this room. So I'm going to say one thing, and it may spur something in your memory, and please feel free to shout it out if it does. The first five years of my public school education Girls could not wear pants to school, right? You couldn't wear jeans, you couldn't wear shorts, you had to wear a dress every single day. And I walked to school, not uphill both ways, and it wasn't 15 miles, it was just a few blocks, but I walked to school, I walked home for lunch, I walked back after lunch, I walked home, and if there was 18 feet of snow on the ground, I was in a dress. Now, you can put on pants, and wear under your dress to walk in the snow, but when you got to school, you had to take them off. Here's my favorite part of that. When I was a sixth grader, not in middle school, but still elementary school, um, the school board decided that girls could wear, and this was the actual language they used, pantsuits. Pantsuits were all the rage in the early 70s. I didn't wear a pantsuit, my mother did, but, so we kind of started trying to get around it so we could wear pants to school. So, then I started thinking about my brother, uh, my next older brother, when he went to high school one year to enroll, and she didn't do it online then because online didn't exist, and they sent him home to shave his mutton chops. Because no facial hair, right? Anybody coming up with some? Anybody have to stand in the hallway with their hands down and see if the hem of their dress was long enough? Okay? Is, is anybody saying, I went to a one-room schoolhouse and we didn't ever 
to argue about what we got to wear? I mean, think about how schools have changed, how dress codes have changed. And I realize we have the joy of having the superintendent here so we could go, what is the dress code here in Hillsborough High School in Hillsborough Schools? But it's changed so much. I go to school and I'm like, wow, okay. And my favorite is, and I say this a lot, and I know that girls are young and cute, but leggings are not pants, okay. So when I think about that, and the dress codes of the past, whether that was about pants or shorts or no t-shirts or facial hair, it was, I know that a dress code in a school is intended to help students focus on what matters. That's why a lot of schools have uniforms. If you're not worried about what somebody else is wearing, you focus on what you're doing. <clears throat> so the word we heard this morning, or Ephesians, if you will, is a dress code of the way, way past, so that people could focus on what matters. And if you notice, it began with the three-time entreaty to wear strong armor. Three times. And I've probably said it in here more than three times, that motivation experts will tell you that if you say something three times, it's believable, it motivates people, and you pay attention to it. Once or twice, eh, but by the third time, you start to go, oh, maybe this is important. So we are instructed to wear strong armor, to stand firm. And as I was thinking about the armor that is described in this, in this passage from Ephesians, I thought about how does that translate in modern day? So the first one, I thought I'd get the first one out of the way so nobody is shocked, or if you are, then hopefully by the time we're done, you'll have forgotten that I said this. But the, the believer is instructed to wear a belt of truth. Now, that was a certain kind of belt, and athletes wear that certain kind of belt. In other words, gird up your loins. Cover the, what's valuable, if you will. Um, protect what is most valuable and your gut. Use your gut. This is where I'm going with this. I want to think about what the piece of armor was. I want to think about what it did. But then I want to think about what it says to each one of us. Are we protecting what's most valuable? Get, get the physical stuff out of there. Are we protecting the word of truth that we know? Are we protecting the love of God that is within us? Are we protecting the stories? Are we sharing them? Are we taking care of what's been entrusted to us? When we put on a belt of truth, we agree to that. We agree to be not only those who protect it, but those who share it, those who offer it to others. And if you're going to wear the armor that is described in Ephesians 6, you've got to consider what it is you're being called to be at battle for. And if we're being called to be a battle for truth and that we wear a belt of truth, that means we have to be willing to protect it at all costs. And then it says that we're supposed to put on a breastplate of righteousness. You know that word righteousness gets a bad rap these days because so often righteousness gets shortened to being right. And some folks want to be right no matter the cost. Whatever they say, no matter how it appears, they don't listen to anybody else. They just want you to know that they're right. Oftentimes they're wrong. Oftentimes we disagree. Oftentimes we're not sure that we even trust what they say. And so we're told to put on this breastplate of righteousness. Well, what does a breastplate protect? Your heart. It protects your heart. You know, and sometimes... Again, we talk about that we love from the heart, or we share from the heart, or we, we want to, to be generous, and, and we put that heart stuff in there. But when we're protecting our hearts, sometimes we refuse to let go. If we only protect our hearts and only want to worry about how it might get hurt, we're never going to use it for the intended purpose. When we use our hearts, when we protect our hearts too much, then we can't give of the love that God has given to us. And so that breastplate of righteousness reminds us that we are to be open and loving, to share the heart of God with others in the right ways. 
Not in ways that are conditional, not in ways that say, this is only valid if you believe exactly what I believe, if you look exactly like I do, if you love exactly the way I do. The breastplate of righteousness opens the heart to all that God wants to offer to all of God's people. Might sound counterproductive, but if our hearts are protected and, and we know that God is right with us, then we have more to share with others. And then it tells us we need shoes for a long journey. We need to be ready to be on the move. How many people in the room, including myself, are wearing flip-flops? Do you wear them on a long journey? Because that's all you got? I can't wear them on a long journey because they start to hurt my feet. If you had to walk 20 miles, would you wear flip-flops? No. You'd want something secure. You'd want something that gave you the best support possible. And that's what this letter is encouraging us to do, to put on shoes that are going to keep going, that will make us able to keep moving. In other words, our feet need to be solidly on the ground. Now, I'm really bad at this because sometimes with my personality type, I like to, like for instance, what are we, 17 Fridays away from Christmas? I'm just saying that. And then, did you know that Ash Wednesday is February 10th and Easter is March 30th next year? And so, while my feet are solidly on the ground here, up here I'm going, wee, we gotta be moving, we gotta be stepping ahead. And sometimes I get so far ahead of what I'm thinking about in the future that I forget I need to be marching right here and right now. I need to be solidly on the ground right now. Do you ever do that? Do you ever think about, thank you, do you ever think about things so far in advance that you forget about the moment you're in right now? And we're in a long journey together. Maybe it could be flip-flops, because that's how you wear what, what you wear to school. And if that's what you wear every day to school, and you are exactly who God made you to be, and you are faithfully sharing good words, if you're faithfully sharing the love of God, then flip-flops are your shoes for the journey. If you're somebody who climbs poles for a living, do people do that anymore? I don't know where that came from. But if you climb poles for a living, and you have those spikes on your shoes, and you're faithfully sharing the gospel and the love of Jesus Christ with all those guys you work with and women, then those are your shoes for the journey. This week we've had the incredible opportunity for the first time ever to see two women pass the Army Ranger training. And if Army combat boots, if you are faithful to God wearing those, whether you're male or female now, and if those are what get you to where you need to go and to share the gospel of Jesus Christ and do it faithfully, those are your shoes for the journey. Think about what your shoes for the journey are. Think about where you go, what you say, how you get there, and what you do once you're there. And the shoes you wear for the journey. Maybe they're cleats. Maybe they're whatever they are. I don't want to get caught up in shoe wear and say, who are you wearing? I'm wearing God's shoes. Okay. Then it says, and this is the one that where it really starts to change. Because up to that point, you've got the belt of righteousness, right? You've got the breast, or you've got the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, and you've got shoes to be on the move. All of those stay on you pretty well. But then it's the shield of faith. And if you didn't feel protected before, a shield at that time would have been a full body shield. You could put it all around you. It was typically would have not been, I mean, back in that day, the poorer soldiers probably wouldn't have metal. They would have had a leather thing that came around them. And burning arrows were sometimes used in time of war. And if you were wearing something that those arrows could stick in, then that would catch fire. And you would have to drop that shield in order to be safe. So here's the thing I'm going to challenge us about, because now it starts to get challenging. Sometimes we cover up. We cover up with our image in the world. We cover up with what we think is going to make us look cool to other kids. We cover up with the things when we're hurt. We don't want people to see that. But sometimes we need to let that go. We need to drop that shield and be vulnerable in the world. You see, I don't think it's an accident that this shield of faith is placed at this point in the list. 
Because sometimes we have to let down our guard, even while we're still guarding the truth. We're not letting go of the belt of truth. We're not letting go of the breastplate of righteousness. We're not losing our shoes that will keep us on the move. But we're letting go of something and becoming vulnerable, willing to take a risk in order to share faithfully with others, in order to be able to stand firm in what we know. And we need to be aware that there may be burning arrows that are still going to come at us that we need to prepare to defend with or without our shield in place, which means we have to know what we believe. We have to know the Word of God. We have to know what it says. We have to know what God invites us to. We may not have any place to run back to. And so when we go out in the world with our belt of truth and our breastplate of righteousness and the shoes to move, that may be all we have because we may have to let go of the shield. But go prepared with that shield. Be prepared to shield others from those flaming arrows. Be prepared to shield others from the insults and, and the hate that comes in the world. But also be willing to be vulnerable to others, to know that you may be the back call to protect them. The writer says, then you wear a helmet of salvation. And again, I don't think this is an accident. Because if you have on the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes that keep you on the move, if you've had to drop the shield of faith, you're going to have to use your head. You're going to have to think about what you do next. You're going to have to question. You're going to have to learn. You're going to have to consider. Where do we go? What do I say? How do I stay in this battle? Because sometimes it takes a weapon, not a defense, but a weapon of offense, to think about what we're doing, to keep an open mind. Because sometimes the people who come at us or the situations that come at us are going to knock us down time and time again. And we're going to have to think about where we go next. Think about where God is leading us. Think about the plan of action. Think about how we continue to offer God's love to others. So we put on a helmet of salvation, knowing that we have this grace in Jesus Christ. And it's not just for us. We have to consider how we continue to share with others. And last, the sword of the Spirit. The word that's used in Greek in this writing from Ephesians Refuse, refer, it refers to a short sword. Not like the kind you see in the movies, like the Patriot, or where they do the, you know, the, the far away. But this would have been a short sword that was used in close, hand-to-hand -hand combat. Sword of the Spirit. You have to be in the fight. You have to be fully prepared. Not to injure, but to keep away that which would injure others. <coughs> Not to slay the Spirit, but to make way for the Spirit. So we've had a description of this armor of God. We are armed and dressed for battle. But our call is not to be at battle, but to preserve a peace and a justice and a salvation that already exists. And I would suggest that we read these words today, not because we live in a place where everybody knows the good news, but because we live in a place, we all live in places where people don't know the good news. And we go in expecting faith, but we need to be prepared to share faith. We go in expecting love, but we need to be prepared to share love. We go in expecting to see the redeemed, but we may go in having to offer redemption. We go in expecting grace, and we need to be gracious. We go in expecting forgiveness, and we may need to forgive. We go in expecting kindness, and we need to be kind. I don't know about all of the words in that reading about the evil forces. Sometimes how we treat each other is the most evil we'll run into on a daily basis. Whether that's bullying at school, whether that's a corporate executive stealing a pension fund, whether that's a, an event at the high school where someone feels unwelcome or not included, 
Sometimes the worst battles we're in are the everyday ones that happen day to day. We may, we may not be involved in spiritual warfare. We may be involved in warfare for our, our sanity, for our good health mentally, physically, spiritually, emotionally. Who are we? And how are we going to help? Not just our kids, but all of us in that daily warfare. Are we going to wear the belt of truth? The blessed breastplate of righteousness? The shoes to be on the move? The shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit. You see, here's what I find amazing. Even though this is a, a kind of a warlike image, when we wear all of that, not literal armor, but God's armor, we are fully visible as God's people. But we live in a world where there's a whole lot of people who are wearing camouflage. Some of them are televangelists. Some of them claim to love God, but don't seem to love God's people very much. Some of them are people who have never known the love of Jesus. And here we are, dressed in the armor of God, fully visible as God's people. Not wearing camo, we're not camouflaging who we are, who we represent. And that's the question we ask. This, this last passage in this story was that the writer said, I am an ambassador in chains. This person was in prison, but still able to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. This person was chained to a wall, but was probably more free than anyone else in the room. And so that story that he passes on to us, that image, was passed on to the next generation and the next. They were all ambassadors in chains in some way or another for boldly preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. So the question is, who are you wearing? Are you wearing the full armor of God, fully visible in the world as one of God's people? Or will you go to school or work to play to a neighbor's house, wherever you go, will you be in camera? Will we be dressed in the full armor of God, ready to share the love of Jesus Christ? Let's pray together. God, we read these words and we consider the opportunities that we have before us. Thank you for offering us this vision of who we can be to be fully visible in the world. God is so God, let us be visible, let us be vulnerable. Let us never hide behind the camouflage of, of being unsure of who we are. Give us that energy, that peace to stand firm in what you have given to us and guide us in all that we do. Thank you for watching over us, your sparrows, and remind us that we are fully dressed with your love. We pray in the name of Jesus our Christ. Amen. Before you stand up, stand up for Jesus. Please stand with him.
over again. So what are we going to do? We're going to wear the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, shoes to keep us on the move, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the last one, sword of the spirit. Thank you. Each piece put on with prayer, where duty calls or danger, may you never be wanting there. Go out fully armed. Go out prepared, vulnerable to share the love of Jesus Christ wherever you go. Follow his spirit in the world and go in his peace. Amen. Amen.